Thank you very much. Great. I'm going to make a case in this short 15-minute talk that we need to involve more, more video games in research. Billions of people every day play video games. They do it for fun. It's a great activity. But we can do so much more with the information we're gaining from these video games. I'm going to take a little journey back on my route through to today's talk. Back in 1996, when the Spice Girls were at the top of the chart, this video game, Duke Nukem 3, from 3D Realms, was released. It was an action video game. It was pretty awful. But it was the, one of the first innovative games that allowed people to roam around in a virtual world. And uh, one of the scientists I worked with, a fellow of the Royal Society, hacked the game when he was a young postdoc and managed to get in and get data out of people. So that was used to make a number of discoveries in different journals about brain science, about how people use their brain to find their way. And that's the focus of my, my research that I talk about. Video games are extremely helpful for us to tackle the problem with Alzheimer's dementia. One of the earliest symptoms in that disease is becoming disoriented. So entering into a game like this is a way to potentially explore whether someone might be disoriented. This game isn't ideal. If we jump forward six years, we get to 2002, when another video game I was involved in uh, began. And this is the getaway. It, graphics have come a long way forward. With this game, we were able to use a Sony PlayStation. Well, in fact, a bank of about eight PlayStations all interacting and switching to scan the brains of London taxi drivers. You can see these, these are the, we were able to use our brain imaging using the methods that Carl Friston uh, developed at UCL. So we can peer inside the brains of taxi drivers, and we can get taxi drivers, once you hack this game again, to drive around central London. Here's King's Cross, as it was. It was a pretty horrible area, I remember, in 2002. It's much nicer now. Apologies for my terrible driving here. It's, so one of the things about pointing out my driving is very difficult to maneuver with a PlayStation controller, particularly when you're an MRI scanner, and study that. It's not the easiest thing. The taxi driver said it was a very good, very good simulation of the no-brain drivers out there in London with the AI back then. <laughs> so we come forward, we'll jump again another six years from this game to now in 2016, where we developed a new game. This is a game called Sea Hero Quest. It's up in the test lab area. You can play with it after this. And the big change here is it's not a game we've adapted. We built a game. I say we, but actually Max Scott's Glades up at the back of the room he's visiting from Edinburgh. His team, the Glitchers, got hired by Deutsche Telekom, who were the funders behind this, who their aim was to help scientists and the games design company fight dementia to build that diagnostic tool. And that's what we did. So here's some of the images from in the game. And the clever innovation from the team of Glitches was to have people navigate a little boat. Just by tapping left or right of this little boat, you can maneuver around. And this is Michael Hornberger, my co-lead, who gave a talk before the pandemic about our project when it launched. So I'm here to show you lots of graphs about what we found from the data, tell you about the differences between men and women, differences between countries, and so on. So big thanks to Alzheimer's Research UK who funded this. So what does the game actually look like? If you get open the game, you can see it running upstairs. You can download it on your phone for today. You see a little map, and you have to look at where to go, and you learn the controls initially. So you just tap left or right. Now, this is Antoine Coutreau, who's the first author who's done all the very clever analysis behind this. He's guiding the little boat around. The whole time he's moving in this game, we're tracking where that boat is and its x, y coordinates, the position, what direction is it facing. And we can calculate from this person and indeed four million people where we're able to get data from where these little boats, where little boat is um, during each of these levels. So Max and his team built 75 levels like this with all sorts of challenges in them. It's a proper game. It was BAFTA nominated. It won nine Cannes Film Awards. It tells you you're amazing. It's a proper game. And here I'm going to show you from the four million people a fraction of that data, 2,000 people, 1,000 older people, and 1,000 younger people. And you can just see by it, they're all overlaid, they're individually playing this, that age has an impact on navigation skill. And it's not just that they're bad at the controls. Because we have 4 million people's data, we can account for that kind of the ability to control the game. We also know that if you do badly in this game, you'll also get lost. We, we've tested people in Covent Garden finding their way around, and in Paris in the Montmartre area. We've tested young and old people. This game is quite predictive of real world getting lost. It's not just a fun video game. We validated that. So anyway, what the point all is very rich data, but each one of these people we can work out what's the length of their path. A very short path is a good navigator, a long path is a bad navigator. So I'll show you the first graph of the day, and I'm going to show you a lot of graphs we're looking across the adult lifespan. One of my pictures today is we don't, we're playing with games, but we don't know anything about children and children's health, and we need to go there. That's one of the directions. 
What I'm going to show you is on this scale is what happens to that. So people down here at this graph are very good at navigating. If you're up here, you're doing very badly. Now I thought across the lifespan, maybe you'd be pretty flat. Later in life, you'd get much worse and we're pretty stable. I was completely wrong. It's just from the earliest 20s, you just steadily get worse and worse. On average, I suspect the rest of you in this audience are fantastic and really good. But worldwide, across the world, this is the pattern we see. It all goes up. And there's a very strange thing we see as scientists. There's an inflection at about 75 in every country. If you look in the Netherlands, you look in Poland, you look in Greece, there's an inflection. And it's a selection bias. If you're 85 years old, going to an app store, downloading an action video game, playing that action video game, you're likely to be very healthy. So we can account for that in this type of research because we can draw on a very large population. You'll also notice there's a consistent male advantage. Men are performing better than women, and I'll come back to why that is in a moment. But we now can look across the world. We're not just looking at psychology students in a lab. We're not just sitting and looking at people here who've taken part. We can map out the performance in a range of different countries. And of course, one of the pictures today is we need to get and test people in more countries that are missing here. But like a lot of health research, we find that the Scandinavians are particularly good. They navigate the best. The Finnish people are the top. But they're joined by quite a lot of other countries who are very similarly good at navigating. And then there are other countries who are not as good. What we're able to do, because we're looking on a worldwide basis, is see that we can predict that pattern across the planet, that GDP, the economic wealth of a country, can predict how well its navigators do. There are some interesting outliers like Ukraine and South Africa. But on the whole, GDP has a strong influence. It's more healthcare, more education, improving that. We can look at video game skill. UK, somewhere near, is brilliant. We're the top country in the world for picking up a video game and learning it. But it doesn't mean we're the top down here. So we can see using that marker. What about that gap between men and women? That's the world average. There's a bit of a gap there. That's pretty much like the UK, if you measured it. So men are doing a bit better. But that gap is sort of disappears. It's not there in Finland and in Norway and the other Scandic countries. And that gap is very big in Saudi Arabia and Egypt and some other countries. So why? Well, we're able to draw on the World Economic Health Forum's data on the gender gap. They have a gender gap index of how unequal or equal people are. So on this gender gap, these are countries with a very big inequality between men and women. These are countries like Norway and Finland where there's a lot of representation in the parliament, a lot of healthcare, education access. And you can see we can predict that gap pretty much, a bit of noise from that. So what does this suggest? It says that men might be better at navigating, but it's very culturally driven. There's a strong impact of the country you grew up on to the extent to which men will do better. What I came today to talk about is how video games can help us with Alzheimer's. And this is one of the first studies. We're involved in a whole range of studies going forward. Uh, and here we tested people who are at genetic risk of Alzheimer's with a particular gene variant, the ApoE4 gene, and showed that this game is particularly sensitive to picking out people who are healthy, they're perfectly fine, they have a job, but they're at higher risk of Alzheimer's. And we hope to be able to use our test looking at the paths to hopefully predict and scale and follow the disease with Alzheimer's. This is made possible by a game that's built to be sensitive and by the fact that our benchmark is 4 million people. So we want to see how well any of you in the audience are doing we can compare you to exactly precisely matched personalized medicine, in this case, of cognitive performance. But one of the big things at the end of this talk, I'm going to wrap up with two studies. One just came out in the journal Nature a few months ago. We're fortunate to be on the front cover, where we asked the question, does the environment you grow up have an impact on that navigation skill? Does it matter if you grew up in a city, or perhaps you grew up in the countryside, or in a suburb? Does it have any bearing on your, your skill? because we suspected it might do. There are differences. You can see in this rural place, there's not many landmarks. There's a lot of trees. You have to travel long distances. Maybe you, you know, have to really think a bit more about the, where you're going. In a city, you're bombarded with information. London's a complex city to find your way around. Does, does one of these help us? Now, what I'm going to show you on this graph is performance. So people who are doing well are up here now. So we're going to see young people are doing well, and they decline. And we're going to cut our data where we're confident at 70. I'm going to get four lines are going to run across here. I'm going to look at men, I'm going to look at women, and separate them by whether they grew up in a city in gray or if they grew up outside a city in green. And what we find is this pattern. So we can see our gender gap again. This is now with 400,000 people we've sampled. But we can see that there is quite a significant advantage for growing up outside cities. The rural and suburbs are better for your navigational skill. 
But that's the world average. And there's a slight, you know, this is, this is quite a significant effect. We, weren't, we were quite surprised how big an effect. You can see here a woman in her 70s who grew up outside a city is equivalent to a woman in her 60s who grew up inside a city. So it's quite a knock-on in, in terms of cognitive ability. But not all countries show that. In Romania or Poland, I was looking at, there's no effect. It doesn't matter if you grew up in a city. But in the USA or Canada or Argentina, there's a big effect, bigger than this. So why? And that's where we went on our journey. We realized that cities vary. Here's Chicago. It's got a very gritty layout. Here's Prague. It's quite disorganized and disorienting. It's got lots of streets going in different directions. Well, you can quantify that. As a scientist, you can say, if I take the United States, how gritty are its streets by measuring the entropy, the organization of its streets? And here, Chicago gets a measure of 2.5. Prague is more disorganized at 3.6. So we can now throw every country of the world we can sample, in this case, 38 countries, onto this line. How confusing and wiggly are the streets? Now, it turns out Canada wins the most gritty down here, and Ireland has the most complex, wiggly streets in the world. But then we can ask, does that affect how much growing up in a city uh, drives? How, how is, this, is this in any way related to that pattern of, of growing up in a city being worse? And it is. So here's the graph of world countries. And we can see down here Argentina and Canada are very gritty, a very negative effect of growing up in cities. Up here, there's Ireland. And you can see even Romania. It's almost better to be growing up in a Romanian city. And some of them, to me, look like spider's webs when I've seen Romanian cities. So we can see that this, we have a, a, a reason for why cities might impact your navigation. It's that you're growing up on a grid. And in fact, in our video game, there are some quite gritty levels. And people from Chicago are better at navigating those than they are other levels. So it's not simply that cities are bad for you. They might be bad for your health in certain cities from the pollution. But in terms of cognition and navigating, they shape, they sculpt how you perform. So I'm going to end my talk by looking at, yeah, interesting, uh, looking at another metric of health. A big one that's quite important to me as a father of two small toddlers, and that's sleep. So we asked in our app, we've got four million people, and asked people to tell us how much sleep do you get? So is it one hour through to how many hours you might give us? And the world average is seven hours. Women sleep a little bit more than men on average worldwide. But this is the graph I'm interested in. And again, I'm thinking, ah, I've not got much sleep right now in my life. Um, but maybe I will when I'm older. Maybe I'll get more sleep on average. So interested now in 67 countries, a vast sample population. Curious to know what people think is going to happen here. But what we see in the data is a U-shaped curve. So teenagers up here, we're not quite sampling, sleep a lot. <laughs> we know this. But it declines at a rapid rate down to the age of 33 in our sample. And this is on average, remember. This isn't just you, or this isn't going to predict an individual. It's the population of the world that we can sample. You plateau until you're about 53, getting not much sleep. And then your, your sleep rises. You're getting more and more sleep year by year as you get to your, your 70s. And what's important from a health science perspective that we're finding by using a video game here it's not, a, it's not a smooth U-shape. It's not just as a kind of change. What we're actually able to see are three phases to the human lifespan. There's an early phase in your life where sleep is changing. There's a middle phase and a late phase. We're not sure why. We've just discovered this. It's been peer-reviewed at a journal. There are three positive reviews, so our team are smiling and very happy. Um, but it's not been released into the scientific domain yet. But we're, we're able to look at this and understand now there seem to be three phases to our life, and they're broken by 33, 53. And it's the same identical points for men and for women. There's no difference. And here we've got an e equal large sample of hundreds of thousands of men, hundreds of thousands of women. And we can also, because we've got a game, we can look, does it matter for your, your skill? Does it matter getting lots of sleep or little sleep? And it can, we can also map it geographically. So this is the first world map I'm aware of where I'm able to say, how much do different countries think they sleep? We haven't gone in and put electrodes on and recorded their sleep. We don't know for sure. But we found out that, for example, Albanians report sleeping the most and that Filipinos report sleeping the least. But you can see by breaking people into different cultural groups, there's some patterns, there's a culture there that means people sleep less or sleep more. You can also use the equator 
and the distance from it, the celestial effects of how much light people are getting, to predict how much people will tell you that they will sleep. So we can see these world patterns in sleep thanks to a video game. We could have run a big survey, but people find those a bit boring. But using a video game, we can get more people. The last bit of my talk is really to say, what about the impact of that sleep? Is it good getting lots of sleep? That's my drive as someone with small children. Can I get more sleep? What if I could? Would it help? So we've got our three phases, and we can break down our, our data into three phases. We're going to look now in this early phase about how much sleep duration people are getting, and does, it, does performance improve or decline with sleep? And we can look at this. In our game, we ask people to just learn the controls. So we get a sense of if you're good at video games or not. You just pick up and maneuver the boat around. We're also looking at our, our navigation task, finding a way to multiple checkpoints that you need to get to. So we can look at these two tasks. And what we see is not much. Not much effect of sleeping very little or sleeping a lot in that early period. People are pretty cognitively good. They're, they're doing very well in our video game at both tasks. Um, so there's a slight dip if you're getting you know, 10 hours of sleep. Same sort of thing in that middle phase of life when you're in the dip. You can see the navigation skills come down a bit, but there's a bit of, a bit of an inflection. What we found is it's really that later period when your sleep is increasing that we see a U-shaped curve. People who tell us they get seven hours of sleep perform better on our cognitive task that taps into memory and planning. And we don't know exactly what, how this relates to the, the physiology, and there's a lot of questions to, to ask. It doesn't mean you should go out and get seven hours of sleep. It means that people, on average, you say they get that number of hours of sleep do well. And so my last slide, what's next? <laughs> so I'm going to argue we need to have greater collaboration. This has been a big success story from our perspective. We've learned a lot more about human health across the planet. We need to engage more with companies like Max's company, The Glitchers. We need to work with researchers and charities and reach out to people, researchers working in countries like Africa. We also, I think we stand to gain a lot from these multiplayer games. It's incredible what people can do now watching my 15-year-old son play some of these online games. They're not just rolling a, a, a sign round. And the last thing is this research is going to give us new insights. We've relaunched our app. We can track individuals now with a code all ethically organized for a server in Cambridge with Alzheimer's Research UK. And we're currently looking to see whether London taxi drivers do indeed still have a big hippocampus 20 years later, and does it help them navigate in our video game? So do come and have a look in the test lab and play with the video game on your phone and help us do more research. Thank you very much for listening.